Take your Bible, we're going to turn to Second Chronicles again. Someone wrote the humorous words that every father has said, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> every father said, don't forget to check the oil. Come on, dads, all of you are sitting here. Uh, bring back all the change. <laughs> Come on, fathers. Uh, here's the fun one. How should I know? Ask your mother. And of course, every, every uh, teenager has heard this. When I was your age, I walked five miles to school each day, and it was uphill both ways. You know. <laughs> Dads are great. Like the son who said, Dear Dad, when he was away at college, he said, Dear Dad, uh, please let me hear from you, even if it's only a 5, 10, or 20. <laughs> <laughs> See, my son didn't live that far away, so that was okay. Uh, have you ever watched a relay race? It's interesting, uh, I'm glad that I have my daughter along here to explain everything to me. <laughs> this is the baton that you have in a relay race. If you, some of you were in track and remember running, and what the main thing was, what was the main problem? You had to make sure the baton get to the next person. And the coach even would tell you ahead of time that this is the thing that will win or lose the race, is whether you are able to pass the baton correctly. And you, you had uh, lots of coaching that went in before the race even took place about how to do it, how to go, and how to hand it off, and all that. So here's the question. A good track coach will tell you that any miscalculation there could end the race for you. Well, many of us as Christian parents, grandparents, pastors, teachers have been fearing the feeling that we are losing the race and that we are muffling the transfer, and that our kids are dropping the baton. Josh McDowell has said repeatedly that he considers the number one fear Christian parents have today is that will they not pass on their values, their morals, their faith to their children? Ever wonder why? Or is this some kind of uh, 21st century malady? Or it, even if you take a cursory look through the Bible, Go with me. What does the scriptures talk about? Adam and Eve. What was it like for them? Coming out of perfection and then having two sons and then finding out that one of your sons murdered your other son? Or Noah, who was grieved because of Ham and the way that he was shameless in the way he acted. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca must have tossed and turned through sleepless nights over twin boys. I, I remember that. Eli the priest was embarrassed by his two immoral sons. David, who loved the Lord dearly, was sort of in a daze as to trying to understand a guy named Absalom. And then Solomon had a son named Rehoboam, who was not wise at all when he had a dad who was ultimate wisdom. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and 33, we read this passage. It is the story of another father-son story. The dad here is Hezekiah, a king who took the throne when he was about 25. And he, gained, uh, he reigned until he was 54. He was a good man. He wasn't perfect. He did right. Uh, Second king says, and led the nation in a courageous reformation that took place. Idols were destroyed. Prophets were honored. Enemies and attacks were defeated. And the name of Israel's Lord was upheld. According to Second Kings 20, also Isaiah 38, the man was healed from a terminal illness. And if you go to Isaiah 38, you'll find out what happened. And you'll also find out what the miracle was that took place, uh, that also took place in that time frame. During those years, he became intensely involved in several projects. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, he talks about temple worship was reestablished, the compilation and arrangement, arrangement of the sacred scriptures were put together, the building of the aqueduct, the Hezekiah Tunnel, that I had the privilege of walking through, uh, the acquisition of flocks and herds, there was the construction, the expansion of Jerusalem took place because the northern kingdom, remember, Judah and Israel were divided. Israel had been conquered by the Assyrians that had come in. And so now they're escaping from there and they're coming down to Judah. And so all these relatives that they have that are from the north are now coming down. So Jerusalem expands as they've got to build more houses for them because of the refugees that have come in. On top of all this, he became the possessor of immense riches and wealth, verse 27. 
And all of the while, his heart remained warm toward God, and as a result, God prospered him. I should mention that when this took place, he was 40, 42. He had a son whom he, uh, or I'm sorry, when he was 42, he had a son with his wife. His name was Manasseh. Interesting that the boy was born and lived 12 years in the shadow of his famous father. The man God had missed and blessed. The young prince heard about all of what his dad had done. He saw all the people that were coming, rubbing shoulders with dignitaries and all that that were coming into the kingdom. So no doubt he was indulged, he was pampered, little Manasseh, uh, you know, had the world by a tail. And, but suddenly we have good king Hezekiah who dies. And he dies at the boy's age of 12. And with that now, he becomes king. He will reign for 55 years, one of the longest reigning monarchs that will take place in the history of Israel and Judah. But you never know that he came from Hezekiah. You talk about the second generation fall off. Manasseh broke all the records. According to the historians, he did evil in the sight of the Lord like none other. He rebuilt the idol altars that his dad had burned down. He worshipped the host of heaven, astrology. He erected all these idol altars to the house in the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire. He practiced witchcraft, divination, medium spirits. All this he did that his dad had taken care of or dealt with. Manasseh even seduced the people of Judah to do evil more than the other nations of the Lord that had been destroyed. You're thinking here, but I thought this is Hezekiah's boy, the little fellow who reared amidst righteousness, was it? it his dad who uh, started the guild of men that copied the scriptures and transcribed holy scriptures so that we have them today? Then how could it be that he went so off the rails, that he was so wrong? Why didn't, why didn't Hezekiah's passion succeed to Manasseh's passion? Well, what can we say? Some issues that you can bring up. Manasseh had his, a will of his own. He stubbornly desired to do what he wanted to do. Uh, he, he was weak-willed, overly influenced by ungodly and wicked associations of people that maybe were around him, 2 Kings 21. How else would he learn astrology? How would he also learn idolatry and witchcraft except from somebody else? It wasn't from his dad. But he may have been, maybe he was neglected. Maybe his father was preoccupied. He was a busy father. He was at the height of his reign at age 42 when Manasseh was born. There's every indication the prince saw little of his father. Hezekiah simply never took the time. So the question is, when you look at that, what can we do differently as fathers to pass the baton to our sons as we give it to them? How do we make sure that they experience the aspect of godly character and become responsible, biblical adults? They're listed on the back here below if you want to look at this. First of all, we need to teach them personal responsibility. Even though you are the only one you say to your son, don't be afraid to stand alone. In other words, the example is that we, first of all, I need to be willing to stand up. Even though others may uh, be involved, take responsibility for your part. In other words, ours is an era where passing the buck has become an art form. In other words, it's very easy to say, well, hopefully they'll turn out okay. And it's sort of this innocent victim kind of vote. Help your children face the hard facts. Tell them the truth regardless. You cannot make your son independent. You have to allow him to grow naturally the way God made him. The most important task we have is to give him the right opportunities at the right time to increase his independence. There's no, by the way, there's no easy formula for this. With the help of your wife, you, can have, you have to learn what your son can handle. Fathers can foster independence in two ways. First, remember, you are the example. You as a father are the example of what it is to bridge from infancy or the, the child world into the adult world. You are the bridge for that. It's also easy to be overprotective, to shelter your son from challenges or tasks that will teach him responsibility. When a boy becomes overly dependent upon his parents, he is often afraid to try new adventures. Or he will fear making mistakes, so I'm not going to do it. He may become lazy and unwilling to take responsibilities and he's hesitant to then open to others. But we must encourage our sons to be able to stand up, to stand alone. 
By the way, very interesting, some, ex some examples that we have just seen in our own world in the past uh, period of time. Some examples like a Jack Phillips, you know that name. Cake Baker stood for biblical marriage. Six years later, the Supreme Court finally exonerated him. A guy named Joe Kennedy, football coach, praying at the 50-yard line after the games. He was fired because of that. Supreme Court again reinstated him. A guy named Blake Treneman is a relief pitcher for the LA Dodgers. He stood up against the Dodgers Pride Night as they were basically going to have a drag group called Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence that just took place this past weekend, basically mocking Catholics and Christians. Dodger Stadium, because of that protest, was basically empty. In other words, do we know people that are actually standing up and standing alone? Number two, we need a sense of security. Security is the atmosphere of freedom that allows you to grow. A sense of security that, that will free yourself from fear and from doubt and uncertainty. In other words, that there's somebody at home that will always welcome me back. In other words, that my family is there for me. And feeling secure in his family will allow your son to enter into relationships with other people. Because he has confidence in knowing you, he can have confidence in knowing someone else, like maybe his wife that will be in the, in the horizons. He will be able to handle rejection. Maybe it will be a girlfriend, maybe it will be the neighborhood bully. I grew up in the neighborhood bully and went to our church. No humor now? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, by the way, I didn't have any problems with that. Uh, when you come back to the source of love that has been given to you by your parents, and encouragement, he can open himself to others. He can open himself up to a future wife without fear because he has learned that he has shown that before you. In other words, I do it with family. That gives me the courage to be able to do that outside the family. But when a boy lacks a sense of security, his negative feelings about himself and others can contribute to all sorts of phobias. To give your son a feeling of security, start with physical contact. When he's an infant, hold him, show affection to him, comfort him when he's hurt. As he gets older, put an arm around him. Tussle the hair. Or in my house, wrestle on the floor. Just don't have twin wrestlers. Tag team, unbelievable. Uh, it's interesting, the... Uh, this year, the end of June, beginning of July, is a tournament over in England called Wimbledon. It's interesting, a number of years ago, there was a guy named Pat Cash. He was a 22-year-old from Australia. He upset Ivan Lindell in three straight sets. After being congratulated by Lindell at the net, he then took off in center court, and he sort of went away from traditional ceremony, and Cash unexpectedly began to bound toward the spectators and into the stands. The surprised spectators saw him walking up, running up the stairs, going up one stair, going up another stair, until he basically ran into a TV booth. And he was searching for a way to climb over the TV booth because his father was in a box that was on the other side of it. Pat finally sealed, uh, scaled it, he stepped into the box, and there, him and his father, on TV, embraced. With everyone watching and cheering, the sports announcer's voice sort of broke in and obviously choked up and said, it's enough to make a grown man cry. Because that's what his dad did. Our sons need physical contact. Our sons need loving affection. Also, verbally affirm your affection. No matter what age, tell him that you love him. Congratulate him when he does well in anything. Work hard to avoid any kind of negativism or sarcasm. Let him know that he is valuable to you. It's interesting, President FDR uh, listened to his son who had come into the White House and come into his office in the White House. Uh, but as his son was there chattering away, he was at his desk working. He never looked up. And when the boy stopped talking, he began to walk out the door. FDR absolutely said, glad to drop by. Interview was over. You contrast that with a guy named Joe Kennedy, who had a ferocious interest in his child's life. So for all of the shortcomings that Kennedy had, his loyalty to his children was absolute. He said, my business is my family, my family is my business. President John F. Kennedy, his son, said, you know, when I was just trying out for the freshman team for some of those swimming meets, my dad was there. 
He was always there. He was the, uh, he did the same for all of us kids, he said. My son had that said to him one time. I said, hey, your dad's here. How come your dad can come? Well, he's a pastor, he has plenty of time. <laughs> Yeah, I should have said that one. Kids need a sense of security. They need a sense that their dads care. So. Number three, self-discipline. Self-discipline in your boy is one of the most satisfying fruits of raising a son. A father has served his son well when he has given him the ability to live a responsible, assertive, obedient life. In other words, that he is, has his life under control. A self-disciplined boy will be able to meet the challenges. He'll be able to solve problems. He'll constantly improve his own knowledge and abilities. By the way, my answer to the gun problem that we have here in the United States is that you can't get a gun unless your dad goes with you and signs off. I don't care if you're 42, you need to take your dad. I think that would help. To achieve this, you have some important tasks. First, correct your son's behavior, especially in the early formative years. When you do that, you show him that he gets an understanding of what authority is about. You also acquaint him with the rules of the road and what life's going to be like out there. Somebody's going to tell you something to do. And correction also establishes patterns of positive behavior, ones that he will follow the rest of his life. Simply punishing him for a misdeed won't accomplish that. You need to explain how he will act and then encourage him to move in the right direction. Also develop his problem-solving ability by challenging your son in every step of his life. Let him see you working on law and order. What do you think? How do we... Get to fix this thing. Maybe he needs to look even at your income tax returns. Maybe he needs to look at the family budget with you and understand how the numbers work and how do they add up. Involve him in problem solving process by giving him tasks that help you or by simply listening to his advice. As soon as he's able, let him participate in making family decisions. Instill a, a desire to achieve goals and enjoy useful, productive activities. The 1994 Promise Keepers Conference, there was a pastor named James Wilde from Texas, and he said this about his own testimony. When I was two years old, my father went to prison. When I was seven, the authorities placed me in an orphanage. At 19, he had a car wreck that killed a friend. He sold drugs to raise money for his defense, and the law caught him doing the selling of the drugs. And with that, he was arrested, charged with a felony, and he was sent to prison. He said, while in prison, he accepted Christ. And after he had served his time and done that, he eventually went from that, from prison to ministry. Years later, he sought out his father to reconcile with him. And when they got together, the conversation turned to prison life. And his father asked him, what prison were you in? And James, the son, told them, and his father was just jaw dropped open and was shocked. And he said, I helped build that prison. He had been a welder who went from place to place to place, building penitentiaries. Pastor Ryle concluded, he said, I was in the prison that my father had built. In other words, a father's example builds a place to live for the children. Will it be a house or will it be a prison? Self-discipline or an undisciplined life? Number four, help them in their spiritual growth. A mother has said to her seven-year-old son who was balking about going to church. The boy said, well, Daddy doesn't go. And the mother said, yeah, but when Daddy was your age, he went to church every Sunday. The little boy looked over at his father sitting on the couch and said, is that true? And his father goes, yeah, that's true. The little boy goes, all right, then I'll go. But it probably won't do me any good either. <laughs> Live up, live up to your position as the authority figure in the home. Your son's relationship with you greatly influences his understanding of what God is like. Your firm leadership and discipline will help him understand what God is like. Model, uh, as we sang this morning, model of praying, Bible reading, people loving Christian. Let your faith be obvious, and when you fail, you admit it. You are honest, you are humble. Teach your son the truths and the principles that are found in God's Word. Better yet, learn them yourself and teach him. By the way, I understand this. It's not the Sunday school that's the teacher. You are the teacher. 
The number one instructor is you, not Sunday school. We're thankful for Sunday school, but it is we as parents that are responsible in teaching. Tell them Bible studies, or tell them Bible stories. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about Paul when he's older. Uh, pray for him constantly. Pray that he will accept Christ, that he will live the Christian life as a teenager when he gets older. Share experiences that you have gone through and talk with him. Discuss spiritual truths as soon as he's able to talk. Establish an atmosphere of freedom in your home to talk about any matter. Be frank, be honest. Uh, show by example your commitment to your wife. Clearly let your son know that his mother is the most important person to you. Spend time with her away from the children. And don't be afraid to be affectionate with her. In other words, men, you have, you have the, the opportunity and the permission to kiss your wife in front of the kids. <laughs> by the way, when your child disobeys her or treats her disrespectfully, you as a dad need to step in. I had a state trooper friend, and his son, who was about as tall as him, uh, he was across the floor. Uh, in other words, I'm not going to take any uh, bad words to my wife in terms of what you're saying. So don't tolerate that. And understand that your, your kids know that about your love for your wife. Respect your son's physical accomplishments, even if he's not athletic. Communicate respect for his body. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a friend of his that he met in seminary. And what's interesting about this guy, his name was Tom. He was a very bright, outgoing, or curious, gifted young man. He was well liked by everybody else. But there was something unusual about him that was very different. Because on him, he had a very large red birthmark that ran from his eye, down his lips, down his chin, down his neck, down to his chest. One day after they had become very close friends, Chuck asked him, how did you overcome the emotional pain of that birthmark? And he answered by saying, it was my dad. You see, my dad would always tell me from the time I was able to understand, he said, son, this, and he would point, and he would put his hand, and he said, at the length of my birthmark, and he said, that's where an angel kissed you. <laughs> Because he wanted to mark you so that I would always know where you are. You are very special to me, and whenever a group, we're in a group of people, I always know right away where you are and that you're mine. He says, my dad, told, my dad told me that so many times that I began to feel sorry for kids that didn't have a birthmark. <laughs> give, give your son a sense. Now, don't go home and put a birthmark on him. Uh, <laughs> Give your, give your son a sense of well-being, of well-being before God. Number five, help him become a, a sensitive person to others. The acid test of all of our following work is how your son steps out into the adult world. As you look forward to that day, can he get along with other people? Now is the time to prepare your son for the relationships that he will have with adults. Expose him to your friends and your neighbors. Let him meet strangers. Show him by example how to get acquainted, how to carry on a conversation, how to maintain that. Teach your son how to react to people who mistreat you or cheat him. Encourage him to be fair, to be honest. Uh, show him how to ask for forgiveness when he has wronged someone. Teach him to be a leader in the church and community. Help your son to enter the real world of leadership and responsibility. I like what one lady wrote to the editor of the local newspaper. She says, as a teacher, I'm inundated daily with excuses. Like, well, I don't have my homework. Or, I need a pencil. Or, I forgot my book. But then along with it is the next line. The next line is, but it's not my fault. This teacher says, I listen patiently to each child's explanation. I'm reminded of adults tendency to do the same thing. Lately, I've considered the matter in great depth, and I've come from a different conclusion about this. Because she says, I now understand that it's my parents' fault. It's my parents' fault that my five brothers and sisters were taken to church every Sunday. It's my parents' fault that we read and study God's Word. It's my parents' fault that we all came to a saving knowledge of Christ. It's my parents' fault that we all 
graduated from high school with honors. It's my parents' fault that all five of us have graduated from college. It's my parents' fault that we grew up to be responsible citizens. It's my parents' fault that we vote. It's my parents' fault that we get involved. It's my parents' fault that each of us is not an alcoholic or a drug dealer or a criminal. It's my parents' fault that five of us so far have entered into the sacred aspect of marriage. It's my parents' fault that each of us serve in our own churches. It's my parents' fault that we love and raise our children according to God's law. In a world that is socially correct to blame someone else, say it this way, it's my parents' fault. It's my parents' fault. As Christian dads, as Christian dads, we want to pass that baton to the next generation, that they would learn how to stand alone, that they would have a sense of security, that they would have a sense of self-discipline, and with a spiritual growth in their lives, and a sensitivity that would envelop them because of what you have shown them toward God. Let me close with this. A former NFL player named Dave Simmons, who is now was also a former pastor, and he writes books about fatherhood. He writes this, nothing is more powerful in a person's life than a father. Father power can be positive or negative. It can make the difference in a person's life for success or failure. Negative father power left me twisted and bent. Not only did it disable me, but I saw the destructive further power flowing from me to my own kids. I buried my dad. His name was Major Amos E. Simmons, retired. I cried because I loved him for only three years, because I hated him for 25 and I liked him just for eight. I felt cheated. I wanted my dad back. We were busy building good memories to replace the painful ones. As I grew up, dad had three goals for me. He wanted me to love him. He wanted me to be a hard-nosed aggressive and to be a high achiever. His heart was right. His intentions were okay. But unfortunately, his philosophy or his methodology was a little suspect. From the moment I was born, he had me in a training program. To make me tough, he would walk me out in the playground and actually pick fights for me against other kids. <laughs> I remember once when we lived in Berlin, Germany, Dad looked out the window and saw three German kids walking by. He went over and threw the door open and said, get out there and whip those boys. And if you don't whip them, I whip you. To develop me into an outstanding achiever, he employed several techniques. A favorite of his was the impossible goal. One time while we were living in Fort Riley, Kansas, I got a bicycle for Christmas. I came, it came unassembled. Dad said, son, you want to ride it? Put it together. He gave me the parts, he gave me the tools, he gave me the directions. I couldn't read yet. <laughs> so I did the best I could by looking at the pictures. Certainly, I was hopelessly lost, started crying. He came in and brusquely sort of knocked me aside and said, get away, stupid. I knew you couldn't do it. His theory was to basically keep me on the leading edge of high intensity effort. A variation of this technique was to nudge the goals higher. I made several second string All-American teams my junior year in college. My dad asked me, well, why didn't you make the first team? St. Louis Cardinals drafted me in the second round. Dad wanted to know why I didn't make it in the first round. By the way, Joe Namath was drafted in the first round. I played in three college all-star games, was co-captain of the South team in the Senior Bowl, and was linebacker with Dick Butkus in the Chicago All-Star game. And Dad was curious, why did they interview Butkus after the, after the game, not interview you on national TV? I seethed with bitterness and rebellion toward my dad. I could not confront him openly. I tried once. I tried once. He broke my nose. So I struck back in sneaky ways that I couldn't get caught and punished. I withheld the only thing that my dad really wanted. Love and respect. I never told him once that I loved him or I respected him. I never asked for advice or went to him with a problem. I deprived him of all of the rewards of what fatherhood was about. My greatest blow of revenge on dad was when I chose to play college football. I had scholarship offers from practically every school in the U.S., including his beloved LSU and West Point. 
either of which would have been looked at as sort of a crowning reward for his fatherhood. But I decided to play for Coach Bobby Dow at Georgia Tech because it was 1,500 miles away from my dad. I had to get away from him. I didn't want him to ever see me play another football game. He saw only three of my college games in four years. To this day, I can't capture the feeling of a job well done. I constantly focus on my mistakes and am negative toward myself all the time. I carry the voice of Major Amos, the commander, in my heart. He speaks to me through my emotions, and I still believe everything that he told me. And even though all the facts say I am a success, my emotions continue to tell me I'm a failure. My dad still exercises formidable power over my life. I realized I needed to convert destructive father power into constructive father power. And to start that conversion process, I had to deal with my dad. With a supporting wife and some professional counseling, I recognized my own share of faith and, and, and faultness and took responsibility for it. It wasn't until I was 33 years old that I finally matured enough to understand Dad and realized that Dad did love me. No father had ever loved a son more. He was proud of me and amazed at what I had done. No one wanted to have a son love him more than my father did. He simply did not know how to express his love and his pride. He was severely handicapped. I saw this crippling effect with my own son, whose name is Brandon. I saw that Brandon went out for the basketball team in eighth grade, and he made the team. I went bananas. My boy, he can play ball on the big games tonight. And I showed up 30 minutes before warm-ups. I staked out a section of the stands where my photography equipment could be, and I scouted the gym to locate the best camera angles, and I erected my tripod, and I put my telephoto lens on there, and I started drawing up rebound charts and shot charts, and uh, I took some magnificent photos, and uh, I saw the coach was there, so I sort of slipped him some information that he needed to know. And uh, it was loads of fun just being a dad sitting in the stands and watching. But the game started. It didn't take long before I put my camera away, folded up my tripod, forgot all about the rebound and shot charts. I got depressed. I got angry. Brandon was a spectacular flop. Oh, he, he got lots of rebounds and points. But it was evident that he was basically just fooling around out there. He acted as if this was some kind of recreational game. <laughs> he didn't crash the boards for rebounds, or he never dove for a loose ball. I mean, he loped around, didn't fill up lanes on fast breaks, and I was humiliated. He acted as if he didn't know he had to go out there and win, and take the shot, and record the books, and, uh, and record the win. And, uh, he's my son. You're representing me out there. So I couldn't wait to get him in the car after the game, with my wife sitting there quietly in the front seat. I yelled at him the whole way home. Where's your pride, boy? Don't you care? You didn't, you didn't hustle? You didn't try? You were terrible out there. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I don't care what your coach says. I don't care what you say. I don't care what your other teammates say about this. You're off the team. If I ever catch you that you're not getting it at all, all you've got, either you hustle or you're quit. We drove up the driveway, and when I got out, I saw Brandon sitting in the back seat, quiet and crying. I walked up the stairs, I opened the door, and stood at the back to let my wife in. And as she walked by, she shot me a smoldering glance and said one word. Major. My mouth fell open with a shock. I couldn't believe it. She was right. After all those years with my dad harping on me about sports, I was doing the same thing to my son. And I knew better. And I had sworn that I would never do it. I would never do what my dad had done to me. And yet I was just like my father. 
Later on, we would move to Little Rock. Brandon tried out for the junior high football team. He made it. Came home and made a tragic announcement. He said he was the quarterback of the team. <laughs> I hated quarterbacks. I was a linebacker. I hated. I hated quarterbacks. Anyway, the kid had an arm, and he could toss the ball. And the season started. He came out passing and did great. He moved the, the team right down the field, and everything was. I was proud of my son out there. But about the fourth game, however, he broke down, he went into pieces, he played terrible, he fumbled the snap, he threw the, 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 the uh, uh, lateral out to his halfback over his head a couple of different times. He single-handedly made interceptions and single-handedly lost the game. In the stands, I began to get embarrassed and disgusted. Finally, I got angry. I sat back and then just at halftime just sort of folded my arms and sort of clenched myself. Then all of a sudden I realized what was happening. I stopped and thought, Major Amos. I thought of myself in the fourth generation rule. I remember I wanted to break the cycle, not do what was so natural for me to do. So I prayed. During the second half, Brandon didn't do much better. But I deliberately concentrated on my own attitude, my own emotions, and I forced myself to withdraw emotionally from the game. I prevented myself from getting psyched up, and I prepared myself for my meeting with Brandon after the game. The game was lopsided, catastrophe. Uh, my wife and my daughter and I waited in the car for Brandon to come out of the locker room. He, he came out and Silas slipped in the back seat. We drove homeward and uh, down our street up to the house, and I let the girls out. And Brandon and I decided that we would go over and do our normal thing of going over to the frozen yogurt store. Not a word had been said. We were almost done, and Brandon put down his spoon and looked at me, and he said, Dad, why are you doing this? And I said, well, son, I'll tell you. I just want you to know that I love you. And I accept you totally for who you are, just as you are. And I love you whether you're the, the football hero or whether you play terrible. I love you because you're brand new, not because you're number 10 on the football team. Brandon's face lit up. First out with all kinds of comments about the game. Eventually I got around to the big question. Come on, Dad, tell me, what do you really think of the game? Tell me how you really thought. And I thought, fantastic, here's my opportunity to really blow him away, you know? <laughs> But I paused and I said, well, Brandon, let me ask you this. What do you think? How did you play? And he proceeded to tell me exactly what he'd done. And he listed every mistake that he had done. He also said, this is what I needed to do to correct it. He understood all of what he had done. Later, as we were driving home, Brandon's spirits were sore. He was in a good mood and carried away before I knew it. He said something that I never have forgotten. It was probably the highest compliment that I have ever received. Dad, you know, you know what I wish? I wish that you and me could have played on the same team. Wouldn't it be great if on offense I could be the quarterback, and throw it to you as the tight end, and on defense we could both be linebackers? Dad, I wish we could play high school together. I wish we could play at Georgia Tech together. I wish we could play for the Dallas Cowboys with them. Dad, I sure wish we could play on the same team. After a long pause, Brandon thought that he had maybe offended me. He wrestled, but Dad, 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 no, no, no. Even if we were brothers, I would still want you to be my dad. <laughs> he wanted us, he wanted us to play on the same team. I think back to August of 1961, when a young man left El Paso, Texas by train and traveled to Georgia Tech in Atlanta to get as far away from his dad as possible to play college football. He didn't want his dad in the same state during a football game. Now comes Brandon one generation later and he wants his dad in the same huddle. Father power, father power. It could be negative or positive. Who and what you are 
will be stamped into your children and will be passed down through the generations to the second, the third, and the fourth generation. Let's pass the baton to our sons and show them what godly fathers are so that they can learn that about their godly and heavenly father. Let's bow together. Thank you, Lord, for the, the wonderful things that you've shown us about you as a father with your son, Jesus. It's interesting that the day that Jesus was baptized on the beginning of his ministry, that the words came down as the dove came down and said, this is my son whom I am well pleased. And it's interesting, Jesus hasn't done anything. And here was a father who said, you are well pleasing to me. May we be that kind of father to our sons. May we always be gracious, learning what we have seen in our Heavenly Father and His Son. Thank you for the wonderful example of this Father's Day. For your kindness, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.